So today we're continuing with our topic on food equity, but we're having a look at food availability and distribution around the world. The factors we'll be discussing today and the points that you need to make notes under are geography and climate, religious and cultural beliefs, government policy, multinational companies, war and technological development. And these are the factors that affect how much food is available. When we're discussing the first point, geography and climate, it's actually looking at the land and um, the climate that affects it. So across the world, there's a very high global demand for carbohydrates. They are the staple foods for most people. So a big staple foods are rice, wheat and corn. And when growing rice, wheat and corn, it actually needs to be grown on a really large scale um, agriculture, taking up heaps of land and uses plenty of water as well. A lot of countries around the world don't actually have the type of land that you need to grow food crops, so they have to import uh, and transport their food around the country. So this, to be able to do this, they actually need to have um, adequate road and rail systems in place. So areas which have minimal accessibility and poor land, they actually can't provide food for their people. Um, in Australia, a lot of those people are Aboriginal people and they can actually find difficulty accessing food. Taking a click from the World Food Program website, and um, what it's talking about is how natural disasters and climate change are actually affecting food around the world. So just pause for a second and read this, and you can make some notes. If you have a look at the picture on the right, it actually tells us that Australia produces enough food to feed 60 million people, and we only have, you know, 27 million people here but we can actually feed 60 million people. And if you have a look at st the statistic as well, 2.2 million Australians are actually in poverty um, and not getting enough food. And we're throwing away 4 million tonnes of food every year. So there's a huge problem in Australia with waste. Um, and it's also important to note that two thirds of the food that we grow, we actually export to countries um, like China. Uh, big problems with um, why the world can't feed itself is to do with the fertility of the soil um, and climate change. So I thought it was a good idea to actually have a look at what's grown in Australia. So our winter crops are wheat, barley and canola, whereas in summer we are growing another grain called sorghum, which is probably not that familiar to you, and sunflowers. We actually produce 3% of the world's wheat, but that 3% actually accounts for 10 to 15% of what's being traded in the world. Another um, crop that we trade is barley. So we grow over 6.5 million tonnes of barley and then most of that is used to feed animals and, and it's actually exported. So the three top grains grown in the world, corn, wheat and rice. So corn's the most produced grain in the world. Um, it is a staple food for a lot of Africa. Um, and down through South America, really good source of carbohydrates, protein and minerals, but um, more and more actually corn is being used to produce fuel and we'll have a look at that in a minute. Um, you've also got wheat, which is covering more on the earth than any other crop. Um, it's also used as protein for humans worldwide. We don't really think about wheat as containing protein, but remember gluten yeah. is a protein. Um, so some people are actually using it as their protein source rather than you know, meat, fish, dairy and eggs, which is what we use. Um, rice is a huge crop. Um, it's the source of food for more than like a fifth of the world. Um, but it also takes a lot of water to produce rice. Uh, here's the next seven crops in the top crops. So we've got potatoes. Um, most of those are being grown in China. Cassava, which you might not have heard of, is a staple food in Africa and South America. Soybeans, sweet potatoes, sorghum, yam, and plantains. So a lot of those foods are root crops and they provide a big starchy carbohydrate source um, for people around the world. So here's our picture on corn and it's showing us that not all food that's grown is actually used for human cons consumption. If you have a look um, at this top half here, yeah, almost half, 39% is being grown for biofuel, which is um, an alternative fuel source. Then the next 37% is actually being used for animal food. So we haven't even got to humans being fed yet. Uh, exporting here, 13%. 
and then this last 11% of all corn grown in the world is actually used for people to eat as food. So while geography and climate are the major impactors on food availability and distribution, um, religion and cultural beliefs also affect how much food is available. In some countries where there's war, um, it can actually affect people's access to safe water and food. And this is by destroying food stocks and livestock, um, moving food relief, so emergency relief from townspeople to the military who are in charge of the war and need the supporters of the military. Uh, farming populations in these countries are often decreased and when the population of the people is decreased, the food production is decreased and then there's shortages that are spread throughout the world. So it's really sad what's happening in the world when there's wars going on. There's not just fighting but there's actually um, big restrictions on the food that's available for people um, and these shortages actually continue even after wars are finished. Um, in regards to religion also, um, the availability of the foods that are specific to some religion, religions might also affect where people need to live. Um, like Jewish people will need access to halal and kosher, kosher foods and often they're only available in large cities so people are forced to live there. Taken another section from the World Food Program website and it actually talks about uh, the effects of war on food. So just pause for a moment and have a read about what's happening in some countries. So government policy is the third thing that affects food availability and distribution. Um, and you probably don't really give government policy a second thought, but there's a lot of things going on that are affecting who gets food. Um, Governments and businesses are often motivated by power and wealth and they're not always the most ethical people looking after the interests of everyone. Um, many people across the world are actually in debt to governments and they're actually growing their crops and selling them to make money to pay back to the government and then they often don't have enough food for themselves, their families or their little villages. Um, so things that are happening in the government that affect what food is available, we've got trade restrictions. I need you to write this into your glossary. Um, this is where governments can ban certain foods from being imported or exported. So they do that to make imported goods or services less competitive than locally produced goods and services, and that's to try and um, boost the amount of locally made products that are sell, uh, sold. Um, so it's, a, um, it's good to have an idea about imported. So imported are things that we bring into the country and exported are things that we grow or make here and we actually then sell off to other countries. Um, tariffs is the next term that I want you to put in your glossary. So a tariff is just basically a tax that's put on goods that are imported or exported. Now I'd known as a fruit canning company in Australia, they actually wanted the government to put tax on imported canned fruit so that um, that tax would make anything that was imported so that came from other countries actually a little bit more expensive so that Australians wouldn't necessarily want to buy the cheaper thing. Um, and they would then keep supporting Ardmona. But Ardmona like, actually ended up closing because they couldn't um, afford to keep up with the industry. So I've just put a fact there that in 2011 and 2012, Australia imported, so they actually brought in $64 million worth of fresh vegetables. Now I find this really amazing when we have a look at the fact that Australia can provide food for 60 million people, but here we are importing all of these fresh vegetables. We're also importing $290 million worth of fruit and nuts and $1.7 billion of processed fruit and vegetables. So that's fruit and vegetables um, that have been changed into another product. So it can include canned or dried or things that are actually included, you know, like in stocks and sauces. So in Australia here, even though we can grow a lot of the food ourselves and we have a climate for growing foods, we're actually importing a lot of things, um, which is probably putting local businesses um, out of business. Now, multinational companies or transnational companies, which you might have learned that term in geography last year, they are huge companies who have their base usually in a developed country and then they have smaller offices all around the world and they also have factories around the world. So they've got lots of money. They've got a high profile in the media. Like if you have a look at a lot of those brands there, you will know who they are. And their big goal is to make money. So um, they often 
make foods that aren't that healthy. So you can see by all of those pictures there, they are foods that are, we don't normally consider as high in nutrition. Uh, and then they have a mass marketing um, money that they can then market to teenagers and they try and get people to buy them. So these multinational big companies, they can actually exploit workers who grow crops um, for them. Um, often their factories are in poorer developing countries and you would have learned about sweatshops um, in geography last year. The other thing that affects how much food is available is technological developments and a lot of our aid agencies now are actually involved in research to try and um, create some technology in developing countries to increase the amount of food that's available and distributed. So I've got some examples there of drought resistant crops, um, harvesting water and creating labour saving machinery for small farms and women. So this is how aid agencies can go in and actually change the lives of people in developing countries. When we're looking at food production practices, these are three key terms that I want you to put into your glossary. The first one is subsistence farming and this is where people are growing enough food just for your family and they haven't got very much left over. If they do have things left over in good seasons they will actually trade them. So it's just about growing enough food for yourself. The second term is cash cropping and that's where you're using most of your land to grow a crop to sell um, to people to make money. So often big companies have um, farms in developing areas actually just using all of their land to grow crops for them so that they can make money. So in bad seasons um, what happens is they can't grow that crop and then they don't get any money and then they're poor and then they don't have access to food. So um, cash cropping also isn't very good for the environment so they just actually you know plant lots and lots of crops and they don't think about the fertility of the soil. So sustainable farming is the third term um, and it's actually keeping the environment in mind and it's not just thinking about the money, it's also thinking about how you're using resources effectively and how you can grow nutritious foods for small um, villages and for people and actually increase the quality of life for farmers and think about something other than making money. The last thing we're going to have a look at is fair trade. So just pause for a second and have a look at the picture and read through what fair trade is. So fair trade is all about creating um, a system where you're improving the conditions for the people who are producing your food. So you might have seen things like fair trade chocolate um, and that's where they're actually buying cocoa beans um, from farmers in developing countries but they're not just buying and taking all their money, what they're doing is actually then supporting people in those areas. So Oxfam is really involved in um, looking after small farmers around the world and helping them to have a better quality of life while they grow all their food um, for us to enjoy things like cocoa. So that's it for our presentation today. I just want you now to have a think about food availability around the world and I want you to have a look at what you've got in your pantry at home. How many foods have been made by big multinational companies? Have you got any fair trade food in your cupboard? Does your family try and buy food that's only produced in Australia or are they just buying whatever's on special or whatever's the cheapest? And what do you think about big companies using small farmers in developing areas to grow their food? These are things we'll all be discussing in class next week.